And I'll be ready in just a minute. Just let me find it on the dial. And then I came face to face with a rat that had ruined my life. It was in Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls! Slowly I turned, and step by step, inch by inch, I walked up to him and I smashed him. I hit him. I knocked him. I hit him. I him to pieces and I knocked him down. Oh! No, oh, take it easy, boy. Take it easy. Excuse me, kid. Well, there we go. This is it. Get ready. We're going to start this show. Well, hey there, everybody, and welcome to this, uh, 55th episode of the Gravity Gravity Cup Show. This is your friend of the wizard, but I don't feel very well, so I'm going back to bed. And now it's time to listen to a little bit of the wonderful and delightful Kelly Erickson currently playing with Teaser. <laughs> Got some seeds to grow, he'll keep you in the know, variety to claim, so baby, what's his name? He's the man to know, he'll make your garden grow, grab your cups his name, he's the man who make a change. Hello there, gentle listeners. This is your roving bard, Leaf Malone, reporting on the Grow With Grubby Cup show, brought to you by DFZ Radio at dfzradio.com. And here they are, the buds of the circle table. Oh, see, it is I, Sancho Banza. Good evening. I'm Alfred the Dungeon Keeper. Hi there, friends. This is the Irreverend Joe. And I'm Herb the Wizard. Psst, it's me, Vinny the Viper. Get off of Riding Puck. And I am your host, the Green Knight, Grubby Cup Stash. Thank you for joining us here on the Grow with Grubby Cup show. Brought to you by the good folks over at DFZ Radio at dfzradio.com. Good evening, gentle listeners, and welcome to this, the gravelly voice edition of the Grow the Grubby Cup show. As you may know, I've had the flu type thing for going on three weeks now, and my voice is just now starting to come back. But I missed last week's show because of it, and I didn't want to miss this week's show. So the good news is there's a new show. The bad news is my voice is still shot. And all the buds of the circle table, they're all laid up. So it's just going to be me this episode. And <clears throat> I've been sleeping a lot. So the, the, the script is pretty lean this week. I want to start off with a couple of announcements. The Maxim Yield Indoor Garden Expo will be in Seattle on March 7th and 8th. So that's just right out a, a month away. So better start making plans now if you plan to attend. It'll be in Chicago, May 30th and 31st. It'll be in L.A., July 25th and 26th. And it will be in Boston on October 24th and 25th. Now, usually I try to make it to most of these shows and do the panel discussion on Saturday, that kind of thing. However, I'm not quite sure what my travel budget's going to be this year yet. 
So if anybody has got any ideas or opportunities, et cetera, give me a yell. And April 20th is coming up before too much longer. And there are a whole lot of cool events going on all over the country. So if you're planning on doing something special for 420 and it involves leaving town, you may want to start checking flights early so that you can get best prices. And while some of the airlines may have nicer amenities if you're willing to pay for them, I, I have to admit, I like flying Southwest as far as just getting you from point A to point B with a minimum amount of hassle and a, a tendency to try to work with you, in my experience, more than several of the other airlines as far as if something goes wrong. Hello there, Mr. and Mrs. General Reader and all the ships at sea. Now it's time for... Dear Grammy Cup is a portion of our program where we take questions from you, the general listeners, and read them here on air. Please keep in mind that that plant that shall not be named shall continue not to be named, so please don't include it in your letters. Now, in today's show, I'd like to talk a little bit about carbon dioxide, or CO2, um, specifically CO2 enrichment in indoor gardens. To start with, Carbon dioxide is one carbon atom that's attached to two oxygen atoms. And basically, the plant will take in the carbon dioxide and remove the carbon from it and attach that, rearrange it to form a, a sugar or a carbohydrate molecule. And the way that this works is that in the in the plant skin, the epidermal layer, on the undersides of the leaves are small openings called stomata. And they're all over the plant, but they're, they're primarily concentrated on the undersides of leaves. And these are small openings that will open to allow CO2 to be brought in for photosynthesis and allow the plant to vent off the oxygen or the O2 and the water vapor. The reaction involved basically takes six water molecules and six carbon dioxide molecules and light, and it will form one sugar or one carbohydrate mo molecule and six oxygen molecules, and it'll vent off the oxygen, and it'll use the sugar for growth. Because of this, if you don't have enough carbon dioxide, then the plant won't be able to do this process, so the plant won't photosynthesize, and it won't, and it won't grow. Now, these openings, these stomata, are surrounded by guard cells which open up when light and moisture are conducive to growth and they'll close in times of drought or high heat or darkness. So if you're going to add supplemental CO2, when the plant's going to be able to use it is going to be while the lights are on. And... So if you're using gas or you're using something you can turn off and on, what you can do is you can start applying it about an hour before the lights come on and then cut it off about an hour before the, the last of it. And that'll, that'll carry you through so you should have enough CO2 during the, the growing portion of the day. Now, that's not to say that you have to use additional CO2 or supplemental CO2 because it's not what I'm saying. Fresh air contains about 400 parts per million. And this is good news and bad news. It's good news because then as long as you just have fresh air coming through your, your garden, then you'll get that 400 parts per million which is a level enough to grow plants. That's that's how outside plants grow. But uh, the CO2 levels are rising. They're rising at about two parts per million a year. 
And right now they're at the, the highest level that they've been in a very long time. And there's some ecological ramifications to this, which are not great. But what we're talking about right now is getting supplemental enough enough carbon dioxide to your plants. And for that, it's great. Um, so if you just blow fresh air through your garden, you'll get a, a 400 parts per million for free. Or at least for the cost of moving the air. If you want to increase it, then what you want to shoot for is somewhere between 1,000 and 1,300 ppm. And if you want to push it, I still wouldn't recommend going over about 1,500 ppm because the the advantage you get is a, is a curve. It's not a straight line. It's not a, a simple, the more you add, the better it is type thing. You'll you max out your benefit somewhere in the 1300 range. You may see a little more benefit at 1500, but it's, it's the more you go, the less additional benefit you get. And you don't want it higher than that because you don't want to create a, an environment that's unpleasant for you. And you don't want to waste the, the CO2. Now to add supplemental CO2, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's you put more CO2 in the in the atmosphere around the garden. You you want a different ventilation system than you would if you were using fresh air because if you're going to add supplemental CO2, you don't want to then immediately blow that CO2 out of the garden. So in general, what you do in that case if you're going to add supplemental CO2 is you want to make the garden itself sealed. You still want to circulate air around inside the garden, but you're not going to exchange inside and outside air the the same way. And this is one place where hoods are, can come in handy because that can allow you to separate their ventilation system from the the garden atmosphere. So, for instance, you may have a scenario where you're in a tent and the tent itself will close and you have a fan blowing the internal air around inside the garden and then you have the light in a hood uh, attached to a, you know, the ducting on either side so that air flows in one side of the tubing across the light and out the other side from the the duct holes in the tent, and it doesn't interact with directly with the the inside of the garden air, the the atmosphere around the plants. And the reason again that you would do this is so that the additional CO two that you're putting in, it you know you don't vent that out as soon as you put it in. Um, but again, you still want to have air movement inside the tent. So you use a couple of fans or a fan or what have you to move it around. Now, professional greenhouses will use uh, a fuel like natural gas, propane, some other liquid fuel, and they will burn that to give off the carbon dioxide. And while this works for large commercial greenhouse type settings i'm not a fan for for home use um there's it, it introduces an element of danger um you know there are things that can go wrong it's easier to you know screw it up and make too much carbon dioxide with them that sort of thing um in a in a greenhouse commercial environment you have, you know, you can have the propane professionals set it up and it's, you know, it can be done safely. But if it's, if it's home use, there, there are too many other safer ways to go about it. For home use, uh, one of the very popular methods is CO2 tanks. 
and CO2 tanks are, you know, it's a tank of CO2, like you'd hook up to a soda machine, that sort of thing. And basically you hook them up to a regulator, which regulates how much comes out. And it will allow you to slowly release it over time. And some of the nice things about this is that you can either, you know, turn it off by shutting the valve off at night or you can invest and get things like timers and sensors. So it'll either automatically turn it off and on at a given time or it will, you know, turn it off and on based on CO2 levels in the garden or a combination thereof. The hassle with it is, and it means you got to swap out CO2 tanks, um, which not only, you know, can be a hassle, but it's a, you know, you're bringing tanks in and out of the garden, that kind of thing, which may make your garden a little more obvious than you may be comfortable with. And it's about time for a break, so I'm going to get a drink and try a little cough syrup, and I will be back with you shortly. And now for a few words from our sponsors. The Grow with Grubby Cup show is brought to you in part by... What the heck ever this is I caught. It hangs on for going on three weeks, and I still don't have my freaking voice back. You're listening to the Grow with Grubby Cup show. I'm your host, Grubby Cup Stash. You're listening to us on DFZradio.com. Your garden's looking far out. You must listen to DFZRadio.com. Hey, brah. Have you seen the new kind new drink from Botanicare? It's kind of a big thing. Uh, no. What's up with that? Well, I was totally pulling a Dawn Patrol, chilling with some honeys, when this troll is like, Yo, I heard your garden is total weak sauce. And I was like, as if, my garden is hella gnarly and bodacious. And then he was like, Brah, if you want your stuff to be like Mondo Narnar, you need to hook up with Botanicare's kind nutrients. Okay, would you be so kind as to tell me what you're talking about? Only the most bitchin' nutrients to shred a grow since the invention of water, bruh. Kind is on the serious, bruh. There's one part base, one part grow, and one part boom. Kind is super rad because it's completely customizable so you can use it with any type of plant and medium, bruh. And what's wicked, boss, is that the proprietary kind formulas eliminate the need to add separate calcium and magnesium supplements to compensate for water quality or specific grow media. Uh, rad. That sounds like my kind of base nutrient. Totally. And Kind Grow has all these primo minerals and, like, super top-secret blend of natural stuff so you can get a seriously lush canopy, right? And with the Kind Bloom, you get, like, this major hookup of phosphorus and potassium, but, like, in a totally righteous proportion so you get increased biomass and flower initiation. And what's even more awesome is you can adjust the levels of base, grow, and bloom to meet the needs of your medium, plants, and growth stage. You could say it's for any kind you grow. It's totally sweet. It was very kind of you to tell me about this. So I should, like, totally hop in my woody and cruise down to my local hydro hookup and score some kind nutrients from Botanicare? Like what? New from Botanicare. Kind base, grow, and bloom. The fully customizable line of nutrients developed for the modern grower. For more information, contact your local hydro store or go online to Botanicare.com. What kind will you grow? You're listening to DFZRadio.com. (laughs) 
Welcome back. You're listening to the Grow with Grubby Cup show. I'm your host, Grubby Cup Stash. You're listening to us on the DFZ Radio Network at dfzradio.com. All right, welcome back. You're listening to the Raspy Voice edition of the Grow with Grubby Cup show, and we're talking about CO2 enrichment. Thank you for tuning in. As I was saying, there there are several ways you can add in. Uh, we talked briefly about the CO2 generators or, you know, the, the burners and a little bit about CO2 or the CO2 tanks. Um other sources are you can there's dry ice which is solid co2 it's you know they take co2 and they expose it to very low temperatures and it freezes and you know it can be purchased for cooling drinks that sort of thing you want to be careful with dry ice because it is cold enough to where if you put your put it on your skin you it can freeze your skin, and it can cause frostbite very easily. Um, it it will release carbon dioxide as it melts. This can be a very expensive way to do it, and it's very labor intensive. Um, it, it's a way. It works. Some folks do it. It's it's not a it's not a method I recommend. Um, I'm I'm not a fan of it. You can also get pads. Um, some of them contain sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda and citric acid. And what happens is that as these are exposed to moisture from the humidity in the grow room, though they rearrange themselves and they produce sodium citrate and give off carbon dioxide gas. And... So basically, this is a, a time release type thing where you put the pad in and it will re- slowly release the carbon dioxide over time. Um, so these are things like the, the green pads. Um, I, I don't know exactly what green pads are made out of, but it's, it's, a, similar, it's a similar type chemical reaction, I'm sure. You can also not only use synthetic methods like we've been discussing to make supplemental CO2, but many forms of life, you know, people, critters, um, etc., give off CO2 as, as part of their respiration. We breathe in air, and what we exhale has more carbon dioxide in than what we breathe in. And I'll come back to that at the end when I talk about my personal favorite way to enrich CO2. Yeast is a type of of fungus, and you can grow yeast in a carbohydrate solution. And... So basically, if you take sugar and water and mix them together and put yeast in it, the yeast will eat the sugar and it will give off alcohol and carbon dioxide. So if you have a container and you put in sugar and yeast, the yeast will eat the sugar and then it will bubble and it will continue to give off carbon dioxide until either it runs out of sugar or the alcohol content in the in the solution becomes so high that it becomes toxic to, to the yeast and it kills itself. Um, and this, this is the same basic, you know, these are the principles that are used to make, um, you know, yeast breads rise. The yeast eats sugar, it gives off some carbon dioxide and it makes bubbles. Um, which makes the bread rise. Or it's used um, to carbonate old-fashioned sodas, um, like homemade ginger ale, beers, sparkling wines, um, uh, again, are taking 
advantage of this process. And with a beer or wine, what you do is you actually get rid of a lot of the CO2 during the process because otherwise it will just over-carbonate it. And in fact, one concern when bottling a beer or a, you know an old-fashioned soda that's that's yeast carbonated is getting that getting that right moment, so to speak, um, to bottle it because if that reaction continues in the bottle, then you make bottle bombs, which are, are probably illegal and de- definitely can make a big mess. Um, for instance, so when I make my homemade ginger ale, I do it in clean two liter bottles because it's that's very active because you've got a lot of sugar that's still in it because you want it sweet because it's a soda and the the yeast hasn't eaten very much of the sugar yet because you just let it ferment long enough to carbonate, which keeps the, the alcohol content down and the yeast happy enough to where it, it will, you know, continue to do its thing um, as long as conditions are are appropriate for it to do so. So, like, I'll stick it in the fridge, which will slow down the reaction, but the pressure will continue to build. Anyway, um, not only can you use yeast, which is a small fungus, but you can use larger fungi. Um you can use things like oyster mushrooms. And here you're starting to get into like the mushroom bags. So you've got products like the my CO2 and that. And the principle that they work on is that, again, you have a, a fungus. In this case, it might be, you know, oyster mushrooms or it could be a, another type of, of fungus And as it eats the media that it's packaged with, then it will give off CO2. And one thing that's kind of nice about the the bags and that is you can tell if, you know, you can tell how they're doing. If they're continuing to fill up and they're sending, um, you know, the, the mycelium and that through the media, then you can watch the media and it slowly over time turns white um, as the fungus goes through the media. And while it does this, it's giving off your carbon dioxide. Um, And last but not least, um, you, you give off carbon dioxide. While you are in your garden while you're, you know, futzing around with your plants, um, staring at them, whatever, then you're giving off carbon dioxide at the time. And you give off a fair amount of carbon dioxide, actually, um, particularly if you're just looking at a small area. And if, you know, if you can manage to bring a friend, do a little heavy breathing, All the better, as long as you don't break the plants in the process. Um, But it's good for the plants, and it gives off good vibes, which, you know, good for the gardener, good for the garden, that kind of thing, and hopefully good for your friend. Now, if you're going to use supplemental CO2, I highly recommend that if it's in the budget, get a CO2 meter. And the reason that I suggest this is because... Fresh air has 400 ppms in it. So unless you're going to raise your CO2 higher than 400 ppms, then it's not worth doing. Because if if you're not going to raise it higher than that in a sealed room, then you might as well just use fresh air. And, you know, that gets you your 400 right there. If you are going to seal it up and you are going to use supplemental CO2, 
then you want to get between 400 so it's worthwhile and 1500 which is about the top end and as i said before ideally you want to shoot for something in the ballpark of 1300 parts per million and since carbon dioxide is not something that humans detect relatively well we you know it's colorless to us and unless it's in really high concentrations it's odorless to us we are really not good indicators or judges of how much co2 is in a room um you know pretty much the first indication we get is if it's too high in the room we'll start yawning more um and that's that's really not something you want to use to judge how much co2 you're putting through um so a co2 monitor can be really handy and with that, it also depends on what you're using to make your CO2. If you're doing something, um, you know, like a tank CO2, where you can really overdo it easily, then it's really important. If you're doing something like using the, you know, using the the mushroom bags or the pads, or you know, something like that where the risk of you producing a, a, you know, a truly asinine amount is actually pretty low. It's more for that, you know, informational so that you're, so that you're doing things in a, in a profitable and useful way. Um, you know, if you put in a few bags of the, mushroom type bags you you're not going to endanger yourself or you know run the risk of of doing serious overkill with it unless you really go overboard with it. you're listening to the grow with grubby cup show on dfz radio at dfz radio.com Listening to DFZRadio.com. Hi, and welcome to Nonspecific Hydro. Yeah, hey, I have a buddy of mine that was telling me about a great additive. Okay, do you remember the name? Uh, yeah, his name's Steve. He's a good buddy. No, no, the product. No, he told me it was a super concentrated organic enhancer. Comes in a yellow bottle. Well, it sounds like he's talking about Florilicious Plus from General Hydroponics. I don't think that was the name, but he also told me it was a vegan bioplant stimulator that contained vitamins, plant sugars, amino acids, seaweed extract. Yeah, that would be General Hydroponics Florilicious Plus. I don't think that's it, man. He told me it was something like Dora Vicious Flush or something, and he said it was like an organic supplement that could also be used in vegging or flowering and that it was compatible with hydro soil and cocoa. Yes, that would be General Hydroponics Florilicious Plus. Oh, hey, man. I just remembered what it's called. It's Florilicious Plus. Oh, good. I was drawing a blank. Florilicious Plus from General Hydroponics. Ask for it by name. Your garden's looking far out. You must listen to dfzradio.com.
Welcome back. You're listening to the Grow with Grubby Cup show. I'm your host, Grubby Cup Stash, and you're listening to us on DFZRadio.com. Okay, for this week's Meals and Munchies, um, I want to talk about, since we were we were talking about yeast and CO2, I want to talk a little bit about my homemade ginger ale. Now, there there's some caveats to this one. Um, one... If you do it wrong and you leave it alone for too long, it will blow up and it will make a huge mess. I haven't done that yet, Um, but I've gotten some really carbonated soda out of it before, so I've gotten in that ballpark. And again, the reason for this is because basically you're growing yeast hydroponically, and the... So what I do is clean out some two liter bottles. And again, the reason that you want to, you want to use plastic bottles is that pressure is going to build up and an exploding two liter bottle makes a big mess. An exploding glass container makes shrapnel and a, and a sharp mess to clean up. Use a plastic bottle. Anyway, so you're going to clean out and... Make sure all sanitary and and safety, everything is in place. You know, don't, I don't want anybody poisoning themselves with it or and blaming me. Um, do more research than just listening to this before you try it, all that good stuff. And if, if in any way, shape, or form it doesn't taste right, don't drink it. Anyway, with, with that out of the way, uh, first thing you want to do is figure out how sweet you're going to want it. Um, I would start with a cup per two liter, um, and then you can adjust it up or down depending on how sweet you want it. If you start with a cup, then boil a cup of water. If you start with like a cup and a half, use a cup and a half of water. However much sugar you're going to use, use the same amount in water. Um, and heat that in the stove, mix them together, bring it to a boil. So if you got, if you're using a cup, put a cup of water on the stove and add the sugar to it and heat it until it comes to a boil, boil it for about three minutes and then let it cool back. Um, the, the reason that you're doing this is you're making what's called a simple syrup And it will keep your soda from getting that gritty, um, kind of almost sandy feel, um, that drinks sweetened with, with, you know, just mixed in cane sugar can have. And it just gives a a little nicer mouthfeel to it. Anyway, so you've boiled, you know, you've boiled it as it's cooling off. You want to go ahead and add a coarsely chopped one to two inch chunk of ginger root. And if, you know, if you care, then what you can do is before you pour it in the bottles, you can strain the ginger back out again. Um, However, I, I just put it in the bottles. And, you know, don't, you know, if you pour carefully, you can avoid getting ginger chunks and ginger chunks aren't that, are, you know, they're pretty good too. So I I just leave them in, but you can strain them out afterwards um, when you get to the bottling, if you'd like. And then you can add a couple of teaspoons of lemon juice, um, you know, one or two, depending on, on taste preference. And about an eighth of a teaspoon of salt, and mix that in and let that let that cool, because you're gonna want that to drop down several degrees um, before you introduce the yeast to it. Now, while that's cooling off, go ahead and get a, a cup of warm water with a tablespoon of sugar and an eighth of a teaspoon 
of yeast. And, you know, the generally recommended to use champagne yeast, um, but I've used bread yeast and, and not found it to be unpleasant. So, you know, I, I tried the first time with bread yeast, and if you want to get fancy, get fancy later. Anyway, the the yeast should start making bubbles, and this is what's called proofing. And basically what you're doing is you're proving that the, the yeast is viable and the yeast is working. Um, once it's, once it's got a, you know, once it's started and your confidence well started and the, the pot with the sugar and ginger and that is cooled down, then go ahead and mix those together and get a funnel. And like I said, you can strain it if you don't want the, the ginger in it. Um, I, I don't bother. I, I did when I started, but I don't bother anymore. And pour that in your your containers and fill them the rest of the way with clean water. And then seal them and put them in a you know room temperature location. And at that point, you're you're making ginger ale. And then what you're going to do is for the next, you know, three to five days, it's a cool room, maybe a week. When you go by them, give them a little squeeze because when they're first starting and you put it in, the side should squeeze in very easily. As it becomes more and more carbonated, it's going to become more and more pressurized until when you squeeze the bottle it'll be it'll be firm it'll go from being able to squeeze easily to being very firm and then it's kind of a judgment call um because it goes from firm then it'll go to a rock hard state which is very well carbonated but once it gets past that point then it, then you got a bottle bomb and it explodes um so what you want to do is keep feeling it until it becomes, you know, in that firm to rock hard stage and then put it in the refrigerator. And what the refrigeration will do is it will slow down the process. However, it will not stop the process um, or it may not stop the process, which means that pressure can continue to build so once it's at that point, you want to drink it relatively soon, um, you know, within a few days um, to a week. And you want to occasionally open the bottle and let it vent off if it seems like it's continuing to build pressure because you don't want it to explode in the refrigerator. Serve it chilled with ice and preferably in a clear glass. Um, because one thing that you'll find is that with the fermented yeast, um, carbon dioxide, the bubbles are much smaller than it is than they are in the way most sodas are now, which is with CO2 injection. So the bubbles that you get from the the home carbonated yeast fermentation is going to be a lot more like champagne bubbles. They're going to be very small. Um, and they're, they're fun. Um, some things that I've noticed about the, the ginger ale, homemade ginger ale, as opposed to, uh, store-bought ginger ale is that for one, it's, it's almost got a more solid mouthfeel to it. I, it, it's it's more robust, um, and once you once you get it down, you can start tweaking with it. Um, you know, you can make it spicier or you can make it milder. Um, as I said before, by the the amount of sugar, you can make it sweeter or not as sweet, and you can really get it dialed in to what you like and what your preferences are. 
which is one nice thing about making it homemade because if you buy store bought, then you get, you know, their process and what they think it should taste like. And if you make it at home, then you can tweak the recipe until it's much more what you think it should taste like. Anyway, um, for those of you adventuresome enough to give that a shot, then give that a shot. Um, if for those of you that don't, um, like we were talking about before with CO2, one thing you can do, particularly if you don't intend on drinking it afterwards, is you can just put some sugar and water and yeast in a two liter bottle and it will bubble up CO2, which is part of why um, I think it's a, it's a cool exercise in that because it really does kind of kind of demonstrate the interaction between the the fungus and hydroponics and you know CO2 the grow with grubby cup show is brought to you by grow with us hydroponics if you're in the Rhode Island Warwick area and you need some hydroponic supplies, stop on by at Grow With Us Hydroponics. Tell them Grubby sent you. Speaking of the Rhode Island, New England area, if you happen to be in the Rhode Island, New England area, stop off at Grow With Us Hydroponics, Home and Hydro, or Three Guys Hydroponics, all of which are very fine stores in the Rhode Island area, all of which are carrying Grubby Cups potting mix. If you are in New York, make sure to stop off at Harvest Moon Hydroponics in Buffalo and in Rochester. You're listening to the Grow with Grubby Cup show. I'm your host, Grubby Cup Stash. You're listening to us on DFZRadio.com. Your garden's looking far out. You must listen to DFZRadio.com. Hi, and welcome to Nonspecific Hydro. Yeah, hey, I have a buddy of mine that was telling me about a great additive. Okay, do you remember the name? Uh, yeah, his name's Steve. He's a good buddy. No, no, the product. No, he told me it was a super concentrated organic enhancer. Comes in a yellow bottle. Well, it sounds like he's talking about Florilicious Plus from General Hydroponics. I don't think that was the name, but he also told me it was a vegan bioplant stimulator that contained vitamins, plant sugars, amino acids, seaweed extract. Yeah, that would be General Hydroponics Florilicious Plus. I don't think that's it, man. He told me it was something like Dora Vicious Flush or something, and he said it was like an organic supplement that could also be used in vegging or flowering and that was compatible with hydro soil and cocoa. Yes, that would be General Hydroponics Florilicious Plus. Oh, hey, man. I just remembered what it's called. It's Florilicious Plus. Oh, good. I was drawing a blank. Florilicious Plus from General Hydroponics. Ask for it by name. You're listening to DFZRadio.com. Now, 
Just as an update on some of my other projects, if you go to grubbycup.com, <clears throat> on the front page, there's the start of a hydroponic store directory listings. And one thing that's different about it is it has a password section where if you are a sales rep, you can make your notes about store visits and run reports on it and all that sort of thing. So you can use it as a tool to, um, you know, help track your store visits, um, where you left samples, that sort of thing. Anyway, if you're interested because you're a sales rep or you're a company that has sales reps or what have you, um, get a hold of me and we can talk about getting you a, a beta test version password type thing. In other news, I'm trying to get uh, Donnie from my CO2 on the show um, because I think that it would be, he would have some cool things to say. And possibly Marcos from the Green Pad CO2 guys. It's a good thing we're getting to the end of the show. I'm I'm about out of voice. Just want to take a quick shout out to the Dewey Mister folks. Um, the little cloner is just cloning along. Um, I've got to admit, I really liked it. Um, like I like I said in the other episode, I put a second mister in it to help with the raise the humidity in that in it. Um, and it's it's just been working like a little trooper ever since. Uh, I've really been pleased with it. The the issues I've had in the past with things getting you know clogged in it because it uses a little sprayer. Or with uh, you know with it getting too warm because the water pump is sitting in the you know is sitting in the reservoir. Um, I haven't had any issue with either of those because the uh, going through the Dewey Mister it doesn't have to go through a small opening, and since it uses an air pump that sits outside the reservoir, it it doesn't heat up. So I, I have to admit. I, it's it, it's my current favorite, you know, cloner type gizmo that's not homemade. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I apologize for my voice. Um, hopefully it will be better next week. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Until next week, this has been Grubby Cup Stash. Peace, love, and puka shells. You got some seeds to grow. You keep you in the know. Variety to claim. So baby, what's his name? He's a man to know. Your garden's looking far out. You must listen to DFZRadio.com.